Hello and welcome to module three. Um, thank you so much for all the work that you've done so far. Uh, and I I'm, uh, I'm, I'm appreciate the effort and the time that you're putting into um, you know, growing professionally and considering some of these practices that can support um, the way that we support students. In module three, uh, we're gonna be taking a look at um, some of the cultural differences that can impact uh, academic support and instruction uh, and supporting English language learners. And so the text that we're looking at um, is called Guilt-Free Tutoring, Rethinking How We Tutor Non-Native Speaking Students. Um, and it's a text that uh, was published in the Writing Center Journal in fall 22. But I want to encourage you to think beyond just applications to writing tutoring, um, although to be fair, a lot of the tutoring that we do, a lot of the support that we do involves writing across the curriculum and writing across the disciplines. And so, um, you know, specifically, if you're tutoring in the humanities, in the social sciences, um, in, in business applications, in many cases, if you're doing lab reports, if you are, um, if you're supporting students while they're writing in whatever capacity, then there's a very direct uh, correlation between this kind of work. <laughs> but in addition to that, there's also a broad application for um, content-based tutoring. <clears throat> so I don't want to limit uh, the scope. I don't want to limit the, uh, the impact or the importance of this text um, to only writing tutors, although that was the original audience. Um, and one of the things I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint here. Uh, where'd my button go? There it is. So one of the things that I want to think about um, in terms of how we, we approach this text is understanding some of the struggles that non-native English speakers have beyond just language acquisition. So when we think about language acquisition, and we address this in some ways in um, a previous module, but a lot of times when we think about language acquisition, we think about vocabulary, we think about maybe um, you know, the grammar, right, that you need to acquire in order to learn a new language. And that's certainly true. But there are also a number of unique uh, guidelines or unique aspects of the English language that go beyond just uh, translation. Um, and so many times tutors who try to support English language learners are met with frustration on the part of the student because their needs and their expectations and their um, their specific learning requirements aren't being met. And a lot of times that's because of a disconnect between uh, the student and the tutor. One of the things that I really like about this text and I'd like you to focus on as we are going through uh, or as you're reading, um, please, I would advise you not to skip over the dialogue. And so one of the things that you'll see is you have these longer, I don't know if this isn't translating well, <laughs> you have these longer strings of dialogue uh, that you can see run down. And it's actually a transcript from individual tutoring sessions that were a part of um, this study. And what it does is it provides some structure for helping some of the more challenging um, cultural divides. And they describe this as contrastive rhetoric. And so contrastive rhetoric we can think of in a number of different ways. Um, but really what it is, is it's understanding that there's not just a linguistic difference between the way concepts are um, described, or excuse me, by, uh, between uh, the content and, and the target language and, and what the student is trying to accomplish. But there's also significant rhetorical uh, differences. And that those rhetorical differences frame everything about language. A really simple example of this, and one that they, I believe, hit on uh, in this article, 
is the way that we instruct, how we instruct students to write, what we consider good writing in uh, academic, American academic English. Right, and so what we consider strong writing is typically very simple and very direct. Um, you speak like you're an expert, you cite your sources, right? It's, it's very much a um, authoritative rhetorical style that you look to um, exert your expertise. In many other cultures, uh, that comes across as aggressive. I mean, if you look at many um, British student papers, they're much more inquisitive uh, and they ask a lot of open-ended questions and they imply uh, correlation and causation um, more often than they, they straight out come out and say it. And that's the kind of contrastive rhetoric. Those are the kind of principles. And when we begin thinking about all of the ways that different cultures manage and coordinate the way that we understand data and research and expertise and uh, academic work, many of our students have significant experience in other cultural spaces. And half of the issue, or at least a part of the issue, is that they're struggling to um, put that square peg into our round hole, right? Into, into our um, structures and perspectives in academic disciplines. And I love that this is directly from uh, your reading from, from this uh, module. And so we can see the way that Korean grammar and English grammar, right? So in English, we say last night I ate rice instead of bread. Whereas if we were to say the same thing grammatically in Korean, now this isn't exactly contrastive rhetoric, but this just goes to show the syntactic or the word order complexity between the two. In Korean, that same thing would be yesterday evening in rice instead of bread ate, and it would be represented this way. Right, and so you can see that there's not just there's not just a linguistic difference, that there's a uh, syntactic difference, and that there is a, uh, a significant cultural difference, even in the way that some ideas are prioritized at the beginning of the sentence, right? So that last night and yesterday evening, um, in rice, right? That, that we have this different preposition uh, that's being used, and so. The way that's represented is, is challenging in many cases. And one of the things we can do is this article suggests that we should do is that we should act, act as uh, cultural informants. <clears throat> and that this is a really unique space where uh, academic support staff and professionals have a chance to do something that you just don't have time or space to do in a classroom. And that is, answer questions and raise awareness about some of the peculiarities that are surrounding uh, the English language and the way we do things, to ask questions and have the students describe how things are done um, in, in the space that they came from. Um, we can address some of our cultural differences and we can, uh, we can look at like what are big issues, what create meaning style issues, when I say global and local concerns, what issues in their work are creating barriers to understanding and which ones are really just nuances of language? Because you can imagine that some of those questions, like you don't, you know that something might not be exactly right, but how wrong is it? Um, does the structure that you wrote something change its meaning? Because that can be profoundly, you know, you, you go back to this example in Korean, if you're answering in a different syntactic structure, it could very easily, um, it could very easily change the meaning of what you say. And ultimately, the more supportive and the more intentional we are about supporting students in this way, um, and the more we foster their confidence and their growth in their writing and their speaking, we feel like we've done more as academic support professionals we've done more to help them grow that we've been instrumental in their uh, in their language development and so we don't have to feel like we've left something on the table or that we didn't give them exactly what they need because what we've done is we've created a conversation and space for some of this work to happen and again as i as i already mentioned these ideas go beyond uh supporting writing although there is so much writing 
Um, and writing is a fixed. What's great about writing is it gives you a fixed space. I'm trying not to show my, uh, my prejudice towards writing, but writing gives you a fixed space where you can examine the way that language is being constructed in the student's mind. And so you can see the remnants of their thinking. And oftentimes when you're speaking, you get the gist of what they're saying. You get the, the drift of what they're saying. And so we ignore uh, construction errors that otherwise would hinder comprehension, that would stand in the way of understanding. Um, so I hope you take some time and uh, really read and digest this text. Um, though it feels like it's a bit long, um, it's bringing in here at about 21 pages. Uh, much of that reading is um, some of those dialogues that I've described. And what I've found is that those dialogues really help me to kind of rethink my interactions with multilingual students, especially ones that are still building their fluency. Um, as always, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to reach out. And I look forward to uh, reading the discussion board. Thank you.